you go, Dave? Good evening. Welcome to our first Brookings Mountain West Public Lecture of the Year. Glad to see some new faces here. I'm Bill Brown from Brookings Mountain West. Welcome on behalf of President Smatrisk and my colleague Rob Lang and all of us at Brookings Mountain West. We think we have a, no we don't think, we know we have a great lecture series this year uh, and we're kicking it off in fine style. Uh, if you'd like to receive notices from us about lectures and other things, just sign up on the sheet out in the hallway there. You can pick up our lecture schedule. It's on our website. Uh, our next lecture actually is October 19th. That's a Wednesday, I believe. We'll have Ron Haskins back, and Ron's going to talk on the federal deficit battle and the super committee, and it'll be a very interesting perspective from someone who's fought the budget battle over the years uh, from within the White House and other parts of Washington, D.C. But uh, tonight, we're going to talk about reapportionment and redistricting in the Intermountain West. It's an issue not just for Nevada, but for many states. Uh, almost a year ago to the day, we held a conference here on the swing region as Brookings Mountain West calls this Intermountain West region of six states. In the, as shown by the 2010 census, one of the fastest growing regions in the country, and that's reflected in the addition of congressional seats in some of these states that Dave will be talking about later. Uh, and that conference uh, led us to start working with Dave Damore, and I'm proud to say that now he's a one of two UNLV faculty who have been accepted as non-resident fellows at Brookings. Another example of how this collaboration is working the way we like it to. <laughs> well, you got applause already, and you oh, haven't yeah. said anything. <laughs> uh, Dave's, uh, our colleague uh, Brad Wimmer in economics is the second one. Dave participated in that conference. Those papers have been revised by the authors, and Brookings is going to publish th those. We'll be publishing those early in 2012. We think it's a, an important uh, snapshot of this region as we go, as I was going to say, as we go into the 2012 election cycle, but I guess we've been in that cycle for <laughs> a couple of years now. <laughs> uh, but uh, Dave is contributing a paper to, to that volume, so we couldn't be more pleased at how he's working with uh, us at Brookings Mountain West in Brookings. In addition to that, he's also working on a course for the spring semester uh, with our Brookings colleagues. Uh, and maybe he'll have time to tell you more about that. Uh, let's see, I've mentioned our lecture. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to give Dave a long introduction. You may and should recognize him either by his face or voice. He's been, uh, he's our, one of our local experts on Nevada politics. Uh, you've seen him on Face to Face on KNPR, and we were happy to, his busy schedule would allow him to talk to us tonight. So, Dave Damore. All right, thank you guys all for coming out. Uh, thanks for supporting uh, Brookings Mount West and obviously supporting the university. Um, Bill gave you a little bit of a background on the, uh, the project here. So as I said, this will be a, basically a book chapter of the edited volume, which I think is scheduled to come out this spring. I'm supposed to get my final version to uh, the editor on October 1st, but a lot of, we're going to see a lot of the stuff going on here is in flux here. So um, across the country right now, in all 50 states, you essentially have reapportionment and redistricting going on. I'm going to focus, obviously, on the Intermountain West states, which are, of course, Arizona, Colorado, Idaho, Nevada, New Mexico, and Utah. And I'm going to focus on state legislatures and um, U.S. House seats. It's also important this also affects things like county commissions, board of regents, anything that any political seat that is district based is going to be redrawn through this process here. Um, so what I want to talk about is talk a little bit about what reapportionment and redistricting are, give some historical examples from the region to sort of get a sense of what the politics um, associated with these processes are. Second thing I want to talk about is some of the regional quirks 
um, that loom large in the outcomes here. There's some anomalies to the, uh, to the six states that we're going to see have a big impact on the ultimate outcomes. I want to give you a quick overview of what happened 10 years ago because many of the issues that emerged in the 2001 redistricting have now grown exponentially and are having outsized influence in the uh, process in, in 2011. I want to spend a little bit of time talking about what happened between 2000 and 2010, in particular looking at the issues of increased urbanization in the region, increased diversification of the populations, and what that impact that had on election outcomes going forward. And as we're going to see, there's been a nice uh, upward trend for the Democratic Party in the region until 2010. Um, and we'll look at the implications that had. And then we'll take a look at where things stand right now and I'll give you uh, my fearless predictions of what I think is going to happen um, once the courts sort it all out. Four of the states are already in the courts. New Mexico will be there shortly. Um, and then the last thing I'll do is talk about some of the implications both in, within the states and nationally and then there should be um, time for uh, questions there. So what's reapportionment? Well, basically after the decennial census, the House seats get redistributed based upon seat states that populations grew faster or slower there. Now this, since 1929, the size of the House of Representatives has been capped at 435 members. So what this means is what one state gains comes at the expense of another state. And once we get down to those last couple of seats, things get really, really, really uh, interesting there. So I have on the PowerPoint there, the, the, the loser in uh, 2000 was Utah. They came up about at 900 citizens short uh, just below North Carolina for that 435th seat. And as we're going to see here, they ultimately sue the federal government on a couple of counts to try to get that seat. Um, they got a little bit of schadenfreude this time around because guess who got left out this time? North Carolina. Um, Minnesota got the 435th seat there. Um, so again, this is a zero-sum game. Now this also within the states, because of different patterns of population growth within states, it's very common to see seats get shifted around in the states. And in the Intermountain West, the big shifts are, of course, from the rural regions to, into the urban uh, population cores there to deal with those population um, changes there. So this is, if we take a quick look, this is how things shook out after the last census. And what you clearly see here on um, the top is the gainers. Obviously, Texas is the big gainer, We're picking up four states. Florida, four seats, excuse me. Uh, Florida picked up two seats as well, and then the other states pick up one. But more generally, what you see is people get tired of living in the cold. Um, and the, the Northeast and the, uh, the Rust Belt area is increasingly growing at a much slower pace and the population's booms are in the south and in, the, in Texas, obviously, and then in this region here. This region picked up three states, uh, house seats, uh, Utah, and they got one this time, Nevada, we got our fourth seat, and then Arizona picked up a house seat as well. So now we have 29 house seats in the region, and that also translates into 41 electoral college votes. Now after the seats get redistributed, then the fun really starts because then we start talking about drawing the lines, the redistricting process. So here we're going to take the raw population data, look at geographic spaces, and essentially create legislative districts that are then of course going to provide you with your political representation here. Now up until the 1960s, essentially states had a free hand to pretty much do whatever they wanted here. There was no federal oversight here. This was largely seen as a state issue here. And some of the common outcomes that we saw were gerrymandering and malapportionment. Gerrymandering, of course, is the drawing of district boundaries for political reasons. This was used, for instance, in the South as a way to dilute the voting power of African Americans by cracking those voting blocks there. In the West, the bigger issue, of course, was malapportionment here. That most states essentially divvied up their state legislative seats based upon county, regardless of how many people lived there. So there was a clear rural tilt to most of these legislatures here. And of the six states in the Intermountain West, Nevada was by far the most malapportioned. There's a number of ways in which you can measure malapportionment here, but this one sort of, I think, gets you, gives you a sense of this. So if we were in the 1950s here, you could elect a majority of the Nevada State Senate with just 12% of the population. Heavily malapportioned here. So what happened? Well, the what happened is, of course, the reapportionment revolution here. And here, essentially, an extension of the civil rights movement and the federal courts willing to wade into these state political battles here. 
And there are three primary consequences of the reapportionment revolution of the 1960s. The best known is, of course, is the creation of the one person, one vote standard. The Baker versus Carr case in 1962 established that for, for, for our U.S. House seats. Westbury versus Sanders two years later applies the same principle to state legislative districts. Now what this effectively does is eradicates malapportionment. Now all districts have to be drawn more or less the same size population wise here. Politically what this did is resulted in an elimination of a 6% Republican bias in redistricting. Essentially, they were able to get about 6% more seats than their numbers would have otherwise have suggested here. A couple of other things that came out of this as well is you obviously now have forcing states to do this on a more regular basis. Essentially, states would do this kind of willy-nilly whenever they kind of felt like it or wherever there was a motivation for it. And if the political branches, the legislature, the executive couldn't agree, it was not uncommon for them to just keep doing what they're doing. So New Mexico used the same redistricting plan that was written in 1911 all the way till 1949. Right. The third thing that the reapportionment revolution, the third change that came out of this, was essentially it allows, puts the state courts right in the middle of these fights. So when the political branches fail, essentially it goes, the reversion point goes to the state courts and they get to oversee the process. And as we're going to see, that's very common this time around in the region there. State autonomy was further constrained by the passage of the uh, Voting Rights Act here. And there's two parts of the Voting Rights Act that are significant for redistricting. The first is Section 2, and this is the part of the Voting Rights Act that says in some instances and requires or states allows them to create what are called majority minority districts. And these are districts that are created with a majority of minorities. Traditionally, this was applied in the South for African Americans, as to create African American districts there um, to undo sort of the history of gerrymandering. Obviously, in this region, this is now contested over the Latino vote, and we'll talk about that a little bit when we talk about Nevada here. The second aspect of the Voting Rights Act that uh, impacts on states' freedom to draw their maps is the preclearance requirement. Um, for a number of states, mostly those of the old Confederacy, that requires all of their redistricting plans to go to the Department of Justice before they can be implemented here. Now, in the Mountain West, there's only one state that is subject to preclearance, and that is Arizona. Does anybody know why? No. They used to be their former competitive ter Confederate territory, and they have a long history of using English language tests to um, essentially suppress the vote for Native Americans and Hispanics there. And we'll talk about they're presently suing to get, around, get away from that here. A couple of other um, factors that have come into play over, over court decisions here to sort of further constrain how districts can be drawn. The first is this notion of compact, that they were supposed to be compact and contiguous. That is, you can't jump across regions there. All, the whole district has to be touching there. And then the, to keep communities of interest intact here. And this is a broad statement of what it means to be a community. And of course, depending upon your political predisposition, you're going to say, no, that's a community of interest. No, that's a community of interest there. Now, for population devi deviations, for the House districts, there can be no population deviation. So within each state, every House seat is the same exact size. But for state legislative districts, they can vary by as much as 10% which is pretty significant, particularly in small rural states there. A 10% deviation can be quite significant here. <clears throat> now, who does this? Well, historically, this was essentially under the purview of state legislator, le legislatures. But over time, people thought, well, maybe it's not such a good idea allowing self-interested politicians to draw the boundaries. And you get that well-known adage that essentially instead of us selecting our representatives in government, our representatives in government end up selecting us. So what we've seen is essentially commissions are now becoming increasingly used to oversee redistricting here. Presently, there's 21 states that use some form of a commission or in some way uh, limit what the legislatures can do here. 13 states allow commissions to do the total process there. The legislature is just not allowed to have any say in this. Most recently, and this is the first redistricting that California, the biggest state in the country, is handing theirs over to a commission there. Two states, they, they serve as an advisory capacity. 
In five states, you end up serving as backup. So instead of it going to the courts when the political branches fail, it would go to a commission. And then if they failed, it would go to the courts. And then you have the unique Iowa process. And everybody talks about how wonderful the Iowa process is, but no one does it. And the way the Iowa process works is essentially it allows bureaucrats, the Legislative Council Bureau, to create three different sets of maps and the legislature then votes on which one they want and they can't make alterations to the maps there. Um, and so they don't take into consideration partisanship, they don't can take into consideration incumbency, right? They just simply draw them based upon geography and population. And what do you know, Iowa tends to have the most competitive races in the country because you don't allow the politicians to have much say in the process there. Now there are a number of regional quirks that I want to touch on which was part for me when I was going through this process was very, very interesting um, and some things I hadn't necessarily thought about going into the project here. And the first is obviously, as Bill mentioned, it's a very fast growing region. The four states with the fastest percent population growth in the country were all in the region there. And you see that in this column, that's the population change between 2000 and 2010. All six grew faster than the national average, which is about 9.7%. Um, there. So what does that mean? Well, for House seats, right, they said that they have to be equal. Well, it's equal at the time the census data is created. So in fast-growing states, that equality quickly goes out the window, and we're very much the case study for that in Nevada. So at the time of the 2001 redistricting, our three House seats were about 666,000 people in them. By the time we get to the 2010 midterm election, CD1 and CD2 are well over 800,000. CD3 is a million people, right? the biggest district in the entire country. So because of that, that's why we're getting the fourth district here. Now this also trickles down, of course, into state legislative races and across the entire region. You see huge disparities by the end of the decade in the sizes of these districts. So they were drawn equal at the time, but by the time, given the growth patterns, that quickly falls by the wayside. The second f factor that matters here is we have very, very, very small state legislative chambers here. We just do not have big state legislatures here. So this gives you the upper chamber sizes for the three, for the six states and the lower chamber sizes. Only the New Mexico upper chamber size is bigger than the national average, which is about 39. Now if we look at the lower chamber size, the national average is 110, right? So the Nevada, Utah's, which is the biggest in the region, is some 35 seats below the national average there. So the question is, and this always comes up with every redistricting, is can we make these legislatures bigger? Well, sort of, right? You can do it basically in three states there. Colorado, New Mexico, and Idaho cannot be increased because they are at their constitutionally maximum sizes. So if you want to make those legislatures bigger, you have to amend the Constitution. Right. I, in Utah, you can make the lower chamber slightly bigger. The ratio is supposed to be, the maximum can be three times as big as the, as the lower chamber. So it could be increased a little bit. Now in Arizona and Nevada, you can simply change the size of the legislature by passing a law. You can do it through statute. You don't have to go through the Constitution. But this, of course, requires politicians in these libertarian states to vote for bigger government. Right? And that's just simply not going to happen there. Um, so what this, of course, means is how this plays out is that every redistricting, rural districts get fewer, and the remaining rural districts cover huge geographic territories here. Right? Of these uh, six states here, the smallest in terms of geography is Utah, but it's the 12th biggest state in the entire country. So these are huge, huge areas in these rural districts here. The other characteristic of interest to us is, of course, professionalism. And this is something that political scientists look at to try to figure out how much capacity the legislatures have. And it's usually measured in terms of the time in session, the compensation, and the resources available to the legislatures. And what you see is only Arizona cracks the top 10. Right? All the rest of them are well below, and if we look, you see Utah at 46, New Mexico at 39th here. So the degree that less professionalized legislatures are equipped to battle with the governors, it tends to work out in favor of the governors. Right? So governors always like to keep the, the status quo because it works to their advantage here. 
The other factor that plays into redistricting is direct democracy. That is the ability of citizens to pass laws or propose laws or constitutional amendments. And we see this impacting on redistricting in two different ways. The first, as you'll notice here, is that three of the states up there use a commission for their redistricting. In Arizona and in Colorado, those were passed by the citizens. The citizens proposed them and they passed them and took that authority away from the legislature. In Idaho, the legislator put it on the ballot and the citizens jumped at the chance there. Now, Colorado has the strangest process of them all, because I have up there its commission and legislature, because they allow the commission to draw the state legislative districts but then the legislature gets to draw the House districts. So it's done by both um, on there. The second aspect of direct democracy that matters for um, redistricting is term limits. Right? That five of the states here have direct democracy. The only exception to that is New Mexico here. And all five of the states where citizens could put term limits on the ballot, they all did and they all passed. Now, subsequent to that, which I think is very interesting, we'll see how this matters down the road, is that the Utah and Idaho legislatures overruled the people and changed and got rid of their term limits. Kind of interesting um, on that. So why does this matter? Well, there's some literature suggesting that term limits further undermine the professionalism of your legislature. But the bigger issue is what are they looking for during redistricting? If you are a term limited legislature, you're all about trying to maximize your party's opportunities so you have more opportunities down the road when you get term, li term limited out of your present seat. In the non-term limit states, it's all about making sure that you have a very, very safe district so you can eventually gain the seniority to become a player in the legislature. As we're going to see, this stuff matters quite a bit. So to give you a real quick overview of what happened in 2001, what you see up there is Nevada is the only state that didn't go to the courts for their redistricting in some way, shape, or form. Right. The, by far, the, most, the two most dysfunctional processes were in Arizona and Colorado. And you'll notice up there, the Arizona did not finalize the redistricting until 2004. It's the same held for Colorado. So the 2002 map was an interim map in both of those, and you ended up with a separate map down the road there. So in Arizona, the initial preclearance got denied by the Department of Justice. Then you end up essentially having the Democrats sue because the map created by the commission, and this was the first time Arizona had used the commission, was not seen as competitive enough. They end up having to redraw those maps there. And the outcome in Arizona, is which we're going to see in both 2001 and 2011, is an effective Republican gerrymander here, even though it's done by a commission. And the reason why is because in Arizona they create a large number of majority minority districts to ensure that Latino members get elected to the legislature. What happens when you do that is you end up diluting the number of Democratic votes in the surrounding districts. So you end up essentially having a more Republican map if you're drawing a large number of majority minority um, districts. We saw the same thing in the 80s and 90s in the American South, where there was a big push for drawing um, majority minority districts in, those, in, the, in the states of the, of, of the South there. And initially, the Republicans were bringing the lawsuits and saying, this isn't anything we want here. Then they realized, oh, this works quite well for us. Um, and then the Democrats started bringing the lawsuits. So very much what we're seeing in Nevada, that the partisanship plays out, is, is very consistent there. Um, in Colorado, you had a very, very miss, messy process as well. Essentially, the uh, maps that were drawn by the commission get thrown out. And then what happens is in 2002, the Republicans gain control of all the branches of the, of the Colorado legislature and the governorship. And they say, we're going to redraw the maps now and make them more Republican. So they have a second round of map drawing in Colorado. That gets thrown out in the courts, and that finally gets resolved there. In Idaho, again, a commission state, one party state, took them three times to get it right. right. They couldn't get the population deviations correct because they ended up essentially harming a lot of those rural interests there. Not surprisingly, that map turned out to be favorable to the Republicans there. 
Nevada, again, the only state where there was no litigation here. You essentially, the big fight was between what was the new district going to be composed of. And Bill Raggio, clever as always, says, well, we want to make the legislature bigger. And so he ends up taking that off the table to get a more favorable Republican drawing of the district there. The Nevada outcome in 2001 was the most typical outcome, and that is incumbents of both parties get protected, is how that ended up working out. In New Mexico, New Mexico has a long history of litigating their redistricting here. And so you end up essentially divided government. The governor will, keeps vetoing the Democratic uh, bills, uh, redistricting bills. Courts end up finishing that. And then you end up having the courts intervene and reshape some of the districts to ensure um, electoral access for Native American communities there. And then in Utah, they didn't sue over the redistricting. As I said, they sued over the reapportionment here. Essentially, you had two cases filed in federal courts. The first arguing that Mormon missionaries uh, doing their missionary work abroad should be counted as Utah citizens. Um, court said, no, you can't do this. And then they said, well, you guys use illegal estimates, the Census Bureau did, to create the 2,000 counts, and those got thrown out. And eventually, the second one went all the way up to the Supreme Court. Um, subsequent to that, you end up with um, the, the, the congressional delegation of um, the Utah congressional delegation essentially trying to change the census rules, and that didn't pass, um, get through Congress either. So that's what happened in 2001, and as we're going to see, a lot of these get rerun in 2011. Um, so what can we draw from this? Well, Commissions aren't very good, as it turns out. Um, as I say, there are no panaceas. All three states with commissions drawing the maps all had those, those maps taken apart by the courts there. So taking the politics out of the process doesn't necessarily result in better outcomes there. The second thing we note is that there's huge variation across the region in what the map drawers are allowed to do. So in the three commission states, Arizona, Colorado, and Idaho, only the Arizona Commission is allowed to draw a competitive map. Right? In Colorado and Idaho, competitiveness is not one of the criteria they're supposed to consider. It's just about geography and population there. Arizona and Idaho require their lower chamber seats to be nested within state Senate seats. The other four states do not require any compliance between the map drawn for the state Senate and for the assembly. So those maps are drawn with different boundaries. So you can effectively, in your assembly district, have three or four different Senate seats be part of your assembly district. That's how it is in Nevada. Um, and of course, everybody thinks this is a partisan gerrymanders are very easy to pull off. They're not. There was only one, and that was in, one, in Utah, right? because the conditions for a partisan gerrymander are very, very rare. You have to have a non-commissioned state, and you have to have the party control both branches of the legislature and the government. And in an increasingly competitive uh, region, that's just very, very rare. New Mexico Democrats tried, but they got stopped by the Republican governor there. So it was only Utah where you ended up with a partisan gerrymander. So what happened under those maps? How did, what, what played out over the last 10 years? And here I want to focus on the three variables. And if you've ever ha heard Rob Lang talk, he'll talk about how diversity and density lead to an increase in the Democratic vote. And that's essentially what we see across the region here. So this first table essentially looks at the change in population diversity in the six states between the 2000 and 2001 census here. So I broke this down a couple of ways. And on the left-hand side, you have the non-white population and the increase there. And then the second half of the table on the right-hand side is just focusing on the growth of Hispanic or Latino populations there. And you see across the board that all states all six states become more diverse. Nevada, of course, leads that with a 10% swing in terms of the diversity. And presently at the 2010 census, 46% of Nevada's population was considered non-white. You see, obviously, New Mexico is the most diverse, but you have, a, obviously, a heavy concentration of Latinos and a lot of Native American, a big Native American population there. But even what we think is as homogenous states like Idaho and Utah, those are increasingly becoming diverse. So even in Utah, essentially, one-fifth of the population is non-white there. 
And then you see in the right hand side, most of this change was driven by the growth in, um, among Hispanics and Latinos. Nevada is a little bit of an outlier there because you have a lot of growth among the Pacific Islander population and in Asian Americans as well there. So about two thirds of our growth is Latino driven, but another third is other um, ethnic minorities there. So across the board, you're seeing a much more diverse population here. The second con consideration is, of course, is the population density. We tend to think of these states as being these big, rural, sprawling states. The reality is that you have some of the most urban and dense concentrations of populations anywhere in the country. Um, Nevada obviously leads that. 87% of our population is in two counties. All right. So what I've done here is you take the, metro, the biggest metropolitan census statistical area in each of the six states and look at the growth in those areas over the last decade, and then what percentage of the population of the entire state is concentrated in those metro areas. In the Las Vegas Paradise uh, metro area here, the 30th biggest in the country, right, grew by 40% in the last 10, 10 years, and almost three quarters of Nevada's population live within that population, uh, that metro area there. Phoenix, uh, the larger Phoenix area is the second most concentrated area. About two-thirds of all Arizonans live in those areas there. That grow by about 30%. Even rural Idaho, you see about, what is that now, about 40% of all residents of Idaho live in the greater Boise area. Now there's two states that don't really fit the increased urbanization here to some degree. Um, you see Colorado, there was a decrease in the percentage of the population concentrated in the greater Denver area. In the same way with Salt Lake City, it went down by a little less than 3% here. So in those states, that tends to work, as we'll talk about here in a minute, against the Democratic Party there. But again, in general, across the region, much more urban, much more dense in their populations. So what does this translate politically? So what this figure captures is a measure of what we call the democratic electoral strength. And um, I borrowed it from a couple of political scientists here, and essentially it's the looking at the share of the, the, the two-party vote for president, governor, U.S. Senate, House of Representatives, and then the percentage of uh, state legislative seats each party, each party has there. Now what jumps out of you, is, of course, is that Idaho and Utah, Democrats have no chance of winning there. Um, across the, for using this metric, Idaho and Utah, which are these two states, have the lowest Democratic support scores of any of the 50 states um, there. So the real action, is, of course, is in the other four states there. And so what we see is in, a, in essentially Colorado, Nevada, and New Mexico, over the course of the decade, you essentially go from Republican-leaning states to Democratic-leaning states. Um, with New Mexico still being the most democratic of, the, of those three. Arizona, I think, is quite interesting, and this is the Arizona line. Arizona bobs up and down almost perfectly with the national political environment. So in the two good democratic years of 06 and 08, they do quite well in Arizona. In the better Republican years, Republicans do very, very well there as well. You'll also notice, of course, is that the 2010 election came at a horrible time for the Democrats. They hurt their ability to consolidate the gains over the, uh, prior, the prior decade here. So in all of the six states, you see the Democratic vote go down in, in 2010 compared to 2008. So what does that mean politically? Well, what that means politically is this. In 10 of the 12 state legislatures in the region, the Democrats ended up losing seats. Okay. None of the five uh, U.S. Senate seats that were contested in 2010 changed parties. Obviously we had a close race here. Colorado also had a very close race there, but in both those cases the Democrats ended up holding those seats there. One, uh, governorship flips. The Republicans pick up the governorship in New Mexico. And, uh, and then you see obviously some damage in the U.S. House. You end up seeing, what is that, seven House seats that were held by Democrats in 2008 go Republican in 2010. Now most of these seats were a lot like our CD3. That is in the sense in the good Democratic years the Democrats won them, in the good Republican years the Republicans ended up winning them. Now in terms of redistricting politics, what this means is essentially Democrats were poised to have unified government in Colorado and New Mexico and now they don't. 
In New Mexico, the Democrats still control the legislature, but now you have a Republican governor. Um, in, in Colorado, you have a divided, I believe the upper chambers um, divided by one seat. The Democrats lost um, to the Republicans there, and so you end up with divided control there. Um, New Me in Nevada, nothing really changes here. Um, Democrats maintain control of the state legislature, and we still have a Republican governor, obviously. And then, of course, in Utah, Republicans across the board. Same way in Arizona and Idaho. Now, a little bit of silver lining if you're a Democrat looking at this across the region is that, well, at least in Arizona and Idaho, commissions draw the maps. So maybe we'll end up with a slightly better outcome than if we let the Republicans end up drawing the map here. Um, but the point here is that the Democrats are in no position to engineer any kind of partisan gerrymander in 2011 in the region. The Republicans obviously are in, U in Utah. <clears throat> so let's take a look at what we have to, to date. And again, you see four of the states have already been to the courts. New Mexico, if they're not there, I don't know if I didn't check the news right before I came, but they'll be there probably tomorrow. Um, so what happens? Well, in Arizona, commission's drawing the map, and the commission has come under all kinds of fire. Um, and the attorney general there filed um, a court case against them, challenged them for violating the state's open meeting laws and their procurement laws. And there's all this concern about who they're contracting with and so on and so forth. Arizona Attorney General has also filed a case in federal courts essentially going to challenge their, the preclearance requirement. And this was, of course, re-upped in 2006 with broad bipartisan support in Congress. It was going to be very difficult for them to make that argument um, in there. There's a couple of southern states that are doing this as well. The end result's not going to matter much. You're going to end up again with an effective Republican gerrymander. And what's interesting in Arizona is that even though the, pop, the, the voter registration is very close, it's about 5% between Democrats and Republicans, because of the creation of so many majority minority districts, you end up diluting the Democratic vote and it effectively empowers the Republicans there. Colorado is an interesting one. The courts are going to decide on the House maps because they couldn't get agreement in the, in the state legislature. Um, but just the other day, you ended up, um, after months and months of, of uh, partisan gridlock on the um, Colorado Redistricting Commission there, is they came out and they approved this map. And what's interesting is about the map is that they drew it based upon the criteria being highly competitive and also encouraging a lot of Latino majority districts in there. So the outcome is in Colorado, presuming that the Colorado Supreme Court upholds what the commission did and nobody sues them, um, is you're going to have very, very competitive context in Colorado in 2012, both for the state legislature and for um, the U.S. Congress. Now, Idaho is a mess. You would think, again, a one-party state, they'd be able to get it right. No, you can't. Um, and so what happened here, in 2009, the uh, legislature in Idaho created a law that essentially further handcuffs how districts can be drawn in Idaho. And what they did is they put a law in the books that says the only way you can draw a district that crosses multiple counties is if those counties are served by a highway. Well, why would you do that? It's a way that they get to preserve their rural districts here. So you have all the constitutional requirements. Now you have this statutory requirement here. And so what ended up happening is the Idaho Commission, they couldn't rectify it. And so their, their term expired, I think, September 7th. Immediately, the Attorney General sues them for not doing their job. And the Supreme Court says, we can't do anything here. There's no map for us to rule on because nobody could finalize a map here. So this throws the whole process in Idaho into a mess. And just today or yesterday, the old commission finally found a map they can agree on, but their terms expired. So what's going to happen is there's going to be a whole second commission that gets in panel that's then going to have 90 days to finish the process there. In the end, it's going to be very, very favorable to the Republicans, as you might imagine. And it's going to if, if that state law holds up, you're going to be able to minimize that urban growth that we talked about earlier here. Nevada, obviously our case is in, the, is in the courts here. The Democrats passed two rounds of maps that got vetoed by the Republican governor. The main issue here is, of course, the applicability of Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. Does that require the drawing of a majority Latino district for one of the four House seats here? Uh, last week there was the, uh, the initial hearing on that. If you're not busy, October 10th, 9.30 in the morning, you can go down to the Sawyer Building and they'll have hearings on that. 
Um, and then Judge Russell has uh, in panel a three person um, masters to oversee the whole process there. Regardless of what happens at the state level, it's gonna get sued in federal court. Um, hopefully we get it finished up at the end, by the time they have to file next March for the 2012 election. Now my prediction is just based upon the concentration of population here that any map is going to lean Democratic. If it doesn't today, it will within a couple of years. It's very, very difficult to draw congressional seats given the concentration here that you don't end up with two Democratic seats one Republican one, the present one held by Mark Amaday, and then Dean Heller, excuse me, not Dean Heller, Joe Hecht's district will continue to be a swing district there. It'll be much smaller. My guess it'll be a swing district. In terms of state legislature, you're gonna end up with something like 48 out of 63 of all state legislative seats are gonna be either all within Clark County or parts of them in Clark County there. And given this is the Democratic stronghold, it's gonna be very, very difficult um, for the Republicans to draw a map, for the courts to draw a Republican map there. Um, we know that there'll be one seat. You know, the only thing the two parties could agree on was shipping Bill Raggio's seat down here, um, as it turns out there um, on that one. And we'll pick up uh, probably two assembly seats in Clark there. New Mexico, they got a really late start on this, but they ended up uh, just yesterday, even though the Democrats controlled both um, houses of the uh, legislature, they couldn't even agree among themselves. So that's gonna go to the courts to finish up. Um, my guess it'll lean Democratic. As I said, New Mexico is the most Democratic state in, in, in the region there. And Utah is a very, another interesting case for a one-party state here. Um, is in this case, essentially for uh, the state, uh, the US Congress seats, the plan that's being floated by the Republicans is essentially to cut Salt Lake City into four different house districts and combine them, make them rural-urban. Coincidentally, that happens to be the one house seat that the Democrats control. Um, on that one, the Democrats say, no, we want three urban districts and one big rural district. At the state legislature, it's getting very interesting there as well, because in that case, you see the Republicans essentially trying to carve up all these little districts to basically try to take out potential Republican challengers, primary challengers, from their districts. And there's a big uproar in Utah that they're cutting up the, the map, and there was even a push to get a commission on the ballot there over the spring, and that ended up failing um, in there. So that's what I think is going to happen. As I said, no one's finished this. Four of them are in the courts. New Mexico will be joining them very quickly, and who knows, we may end up getting a legal challenge in Utah um, very soon enough there. So what are the implications of this? Now, in the redistricting literature, essentially you have two schools of thought. The first is that this is the most political activity in America, that this is all about partisanship, winning and losing here. And you certainly do see a fair amount of the politics that we'd expect to see in any redistricting here. Now, in the swing states, Nevada, Colorado, New Mexico, where there's divided government, everybody's trying to get the best outcome from their parties, no one can agree, those are all gonna be dealt with in the courts. In the case of Arizona, because again of the creation of so many majority minority districts, you end up essentially having a partisan map in, those, in, the, in that state as well. What I thought was sort of surprised me was looking what happens in these red states where you think it would be very easy to do this, but the real fight in the red states is about what particular parts of the map they're going to um, actually represent there. So in Idaho, it's all about trying to preserve these rural communities to make sure you have a lot of rural districts created um, for the state legislature. In Idaho, and excuse me, in Utah, they're going the opposite direction. They're carving up all these little communities to try to create these in uh, districts that are specific to each incumbent in there. And the question is, why does this work out? And it goes back to the old term limits. As I said, Utah and Idaho, voters impose term limits on the legislature. The legislature passed law getting rid of those term limits. Not that any legislator wouldn't love to do that, but they actually succeeded in those two states. So they have a different set of, um, of, of, of factors to consider here. And in those cases, it's all about longevity. The only way you're gonna get power in those legislators legislatures is through seniority, so you want to make sure that you're going to be there for a long time, and since it's not really going to get a competition in a general election, it's all about ensuring that you don't get a primary election. Right? In Idaho, again, it's traditionally been dominated by rural interests there, and so as I said, they put that law in place in 2009 to ensure that rural districts get created and it's not just a total uh, urban um, redistricting plan there.
There's another school of thought, however, that argues that, yeah, all that stuff goes on here. But what's really important in, the, in redistricting is it creates a lot of uncertainty and it just simply shakes up the political environment there. And so you really, you know, the maps are just a guess of what people think are going to happen. And so in, there's certainly some of that in the Intermountain West. And there's two factors to consider here about that create a good deal of uncertainty here. The first is obviously the future growth patterns. Now, the economic downturn has slowed growth across the region, but these states are all still going to continue to grow. They're going to continue to be more diverse, and they're going to continue to be more urbanized there. So whichever party is able to capitalize on that is going to be in a good position. Last decade, it was the Democrats who were able to do that. We'll see if the Republicans have learned any um, lessons. The other factor that I think creates a little bit of a wild card here is you have the fastest growing political group in the region are nonpartisans. So at the time of the, the midterm election um, in Arizona, 30% of voters were nonpartisan. In Colorado, it was 26%. In New Mexico and Nevada, it's about 15% here. Utah and Idaho, they don't report um, partisan registration figures, not much variation there, I suppose. Um, and so what that means, again, these voters are less beholden to any party. They're going to be going to swing a little bit with the national forces. So again, this gives opportunities for both parties here who can reach out to, 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 these, to this growing nonpartisan block here and who's able to successfully manage that is probably going to win a lot of the region's elections in the next uh, decade here. There are obviously a couple more, some, some more definitive implications that are going to arise here. The first is, despite the attempts by, in Idaho, across the board we're going to see a reduction in rural influence. There's just going to be less standalone rural districts. Term limits are also kicking in, for example, in Nevada, so the seniority that a lot of the rural legislators enjoyed is going to fall by the wayside there. And so this will allow urban interests over the next decade to try to realign uh, state policy with sort of demographic reality, if you will. Um, the, the reduction in influence among rural legislators is going to be picked up by minorities, most notably um, Latino legislators. Um, in all six states across the region in the last decade, you saw even, except I think Idaho had one Latino legislator, but even in Utah, I think uh, the 2011 session, there were five Latino legislators in the Utah um, state legislature there. So obviously that's going to be the fast rising group here. Now we've seen in the region obviously states like Arizona where you have very hard line positions there um, that that's been a boon for the Democrats here but you also see governors like Brian Sandoval, Susana Martinez in New Mexico who take a more conciliatory um, approach on a lot of the, 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 those issues there. And so the question is at the end of the day are all the Latinos who are going to be elected over the next decade are they all going to have D's next to their name or will some of them have ours next to them in WAME as well? I think that's the real interesting question there. Now, if we look at the implications nationally, it's a little bit of a mixed bag. Um, yes, we picked up three House seats across the region here, but we all still only have 29. Guess how many California has our western neighbor? 53, right? So the, all of our six states are just a little more than half of California's there. Moreover, we send a split partisan delegation there, and a lot of the seats in the region are competitive or will be competitive there. So it's going to be very, very difficult for our House members from the region to accrue enough seniority and enough clout to become real players in the House of Representatives there. So what about the Senate? Well, things are a little better in the Senate because obviously the Senate has a small state bias. Clearly, we have the Senate majority leader from Nevada, and that's obviously helpful for the region. But there's been a lot of retirements one way or the other, most notably in the 2012 uh, uh, electoral cycle, John Kyle of Arizona and Jeff Bingham of New Mexico are retiring. Um, those guys have been there, not forever, but close to it there. And so if you look at the, 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 the six states and the 12 members of the Senate delegation there, you obviously have Reed, Mike Crapo of Idaho, and John McCain. And assuming that Orrin Hatch doesn't get a Tea Party challenge in Utah this year, those will be the only four senators with more than one full term in the Senate. So we're going to have a pretty young Senate delegation from the region. Now, in terms of the presidential elections, there will be three presidential elections in this decade, 2012, 2016, and 2020. 
Now obviously Colorado, New Mexico, and Nevada were all swing states in the last couple of electoral cycles. Bush wins them in 2004, all three of those states. Obama flips them blue in 2008. My guess is by very soon, either 2012 or 2016, Arizona will become the next swing, the swing state, at least for presidential elections there. And so you're going to see a lot of attention by both parties on the region, particularly in the, in the upcoming presidential elections here. And obviously, even though it's not a lot of electoral college votes in the region, given how competitive the country is, these states might ultimately make the difference. Thank you. So I'd be happy to take any questions. Yeah, sir. If there is a Democratic majority in a particular area, can it be gerrymandered to where ultimately a Republican would win, or is it just presumed that uh, there's no way you could gerrymander in that kind of election? In an urban or rural context? In a, in a, uh, in a urban. It's more, it, I mean, it's possible. I um, mean, what you end up doing is essentially you end up creating a lot of safe seats for both parties. So there's very few sw swing districts there. But let's take Clark County, right, where there's just simply more Democrats um, there and they're spread out more. So it's easier to draw more Democratic districts there. It's, it's doable, but now that the courts are going to be doing it, it's going to be much more difficult than you would say if the legislature, like in the Utah situation where they, they can run the board there. Uh, how is uh, <laughs> it's in the eye of the beholder, I suppose. Um, it's, you know, we basically call it drawing the lines for partisan gain or for political reasons here. And as I said a moment ago, I think I missed that point when I was doing that, is the courts have ruled on this on, on partisan gerrymandering, they said that's constitutional. Um, in particular because they can't create a standard by which is too partisan there. Where they've said on the racial issue is racial gerrymandering is not constitutional. And they sort of created, carved out a little bit of a middle ground there. They say race cannot be the predominant reason why you draw a district, but it also can't be used to hurt minority voting interests there. So the partisan stuff's fine. And so what they're going to do in Utah, that'll pass constitutional mustard. What they're going to try to, with, you know, the issue here is ultimately up to judicial interpretation. Is it also geographical speaking? I, I, I'm from Ohio, really. And what they're doing is they're they're attempting to merge a district northeastern Ohio and northwestern Pacific <laughs> Cap. The yeah, and that, I mean, you see that all the time, and that's the issue of how you interpret contiguousness. And it's not uncommon for that stuff to actually pass, right? As, as long as, it, if it's done on partisan reasons, you're not hurting anybody, you're not harming any community of interest, the courts will generally uphold that kind of stuff, unless there's a racial minority that's going to be hurt by that. I'm just curious why you left Montana out of the... <laughs> well, Bill, why do we leave Montana out? <laughs> Mountain West, we leave Montana out because it, it lacks the urban numbers to, to qualify for what we look at as major metropolitan areas. There's no they, urban. They, Same way with Wyoming. Right? So they're, you know. Idaho is sort of on the border of that, <laughs> but they have Boise. Yeah, so. and Boise is now 40% of the population. So you, what they're interested in is that you know, these rural, traditional rural states, but you have these huge metropolitan areas in them, and how does that sort of play out? Pardon me? Can you explain green Senate delegation? Oh, green just being not a lot of experience. Right? The Senate is you know, an institution where seniority dominates here. And our, you know, then at, after the 2012 election, only four of our senators from the region are going to have more than one term. So you're going to have you know, eight freshmen. right? You know, so Berkeley Heller, new member there. You have a lot of retirements across the board. You had, a, in last time around, you had uh, Robert Bennett in Utah lose a primary challenge. Um, the, the, the issues up in Idaho with what's his name um, that created a new, a new vacancy. So across the board, um, and Obama also, you know, he promoted uh, the Colorado Senator uh, Salazar to Interior Secretary, and so you had all these sort of musical chairs, and so you end up, we end up across the board with less seniority. Do you see any implications for polarization issues in terms of the different methods? You mean, um, well, I mean, that's 
you're going to see that, I mean, across the board, in the polarization comes through what actually turns out in the primaries. I mean, that's, that's the other issues. Yeah, you're going to build, you may build a lot of safe districts through this process there, but where you end up with the polarization is the, the incumbents in those situations, they don't really have to worry about a general election challenge. Their more concern is about a primary challenge, so they may be less likely to compromise, don't want to be seen as a moderate, so they don't draw that primary challenge, right? You know, something like Shelley Berkeley's district's a classic example, right? She doesn't have to worry about losing a Republican, just worry about getting a, a primary challenge. And that's the concern. Obviously, on the Republican side with um, the Tea Party, um, you see that across the board. But even now, there's some concern that some of the unions might be running Democratic primary challengers as well. And that leads to some of that polarization. <coughs> Someone recently said that California is talking about trying to split the vote. I know they're not part of that, this. Are, are you familiar with what they're talking about and, and to make the state more relevant for? There's been a push. You see that Pennsylvania is doing the same thing. Um, and there's been a couple of movements. And they work a couple of different ways. The first is that a state's electoral college votes would go to the overall winner, regardless of how the state voted. And then what they're trying to do in Pennsylvania is award them based upon House districts. So the overall winner would get the two electoral college votes for the Senate seats. And then within each House district, whoever won that House district would get that. And that's how Nebraska does it, and one of the Northeastern states does it. Um, so there's a lot of concern about that, but it only works if everybody does it. <laughs> right? If all, some of the other states don't end up doing it, you kind of end up shooting yourself in the foot. So you don't see much movement toward that? I mean, there's been, a, there's been a talk about it, but one thing we know is politicians hate uncertainty, and they're the ones who have to do it. Right? They're the ones who'd have to pass a law, unless you did an initiative or something along those lines there. Is that anything they hate? And they already hate the commission now in California. In California, they're doing the commission this time around. They're also, in 2012, changing their whole primary process, which will it'll make all this uncertainty. So you throw that in on top of it, I don't know what would happen there. So you mentioned at the start that if those two um, states that waited until 2004 to get everything sorted out, and that has an impact on border regions and city council and all the other... Well, those areas. maps are usually done separately, right? Um, and in, the, in, the, in, 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 in Arizona, they draw one map for their state legislature, one map for their Congress, and then one separate for those other ones. So that only impacted on their state or their congressional races. So the other... The other stuff was, yeah, I mean, you, you, would have separate, you could have separate challenges on those, but usually people don't care enough about those to, 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 to fight for them or have the resources to do it. Uh, does the growing Latino vote go a deal for the Republicans? Um, so far it has. Um, you know, you look across the, the region, that generally it's about a two to one split uh, is how the vote goes. Nevada is about 70-30. Um, on there, and a lot of it's, it's two forces there. Um, the Democrats have put a lot of resources into outreach and mobilization and recruitment, and then of course, you know, the policies coming out of states like Arizona also tend to, to help the Democrats there. So you get sort of this, both forces working there. But that's the real interesting question, and so again, you see someone like a Sandoval, who's much less combative than you would see maybe in Arizona, and even against Susana Martinez in, in, in uh, Republican governor of New Mexico. So there is a little bit of a learning curve, but obviously that's the, that's the way the, the region's going. And you know, by the end of by 2010, or by 2020, you could effectively have New, Nevada, potentially Arizona, joining New Mexico has states where you have non-white po majority populations. So whichever party is able to take advantage of that, that's going to do well for them. <coughs> uh, ask the last question okay. If I uh, on that line, if I remember my numbers right, with this last census, Las Vegas just became a majority minority city. Mm -hmm. That is, the under 18 population, the majority of that is minority now. So, that, of course, that's a non-voting population. But in so, a handful of election right. cycles. So when districts are drawn now, as you mentioned, 
that they go out of date, if you will, pretty quickly because mm -hmm. they're drawn for the voting population, correct? No, they're drawn, well, that's a good question, right? It depends how crafty you are, right? right? Because um, it's based on just population, not on right. voters. Right. And so if you look at the Utah gerrymander from 10 years ago, what they ended up doing was overpopulating using that 10% variation and making the Democratic districts bigger and putting more Democratic voters in those districts so you essentially dilute the Democratic vote. The Republican districts were smaller in terms of population and they had less number of actual voters in them. So they're able to win more seats with less votes. And so your point about, again, about the, the decisions on all this redistricting be, being out of date in two years, four if, years, if six that, years. Yeah. It, It'll be a little, I think they have, they'll might. What's amazing though with that is you look at the Nevada map that they created 10 years ago and it performed even with all that the way you'd expect it to, right? CD3 was supposed to be a swing district. It swung perfectly with the, with the national tides. Where I live in Green Valley, it's right on the border, right? In the good Democratic years, the Democrats won those seats. In the good Republican years, the Republicans won in the same way up in the, uh, in the northeast part of there. So it's amazing how the maps, you know, you think it's this horrible process, but they end up performing quite well over the, even with all that change. Thank you all for coming. Dave will hang around if you have some more questions, but I, we promise to get people out of here at 6.30, so I don't want you to feel obligated to stay for those of us who can't get enough of this stuff. I hope we see you on the 19th. Thank you.